Greetings, this is Greg. On a layover recently, I went to the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs, and when I went in, I saw this. Obviously, it's a P-47, but this one is special. Notice those trays under the plane. Those are there to collect oil, which told me right away this is almost certainly a flyable example, which turned out to be the case. Now, radial engines always leak oil, but the fact that there are three trays under this plane indicates that this one is not only likely flyable, but that it has a functional turbo supercharging system, which is very rare in modern times. The only P-47s I have seen before that had their turbos still installed were in museums and roped off, so I couldn't get that close, but this wasn't the case here. Not only that, but this is a P-47D40, which was really the ultimate version of this plane to see combat in significant numbers during World War II. I'm excluding the Taiwan Strait crisis here, of course. Sure, there was the P-47M, as in Mike, but that only saw combat in very limited numbers with one squadron near the end of the war in Europe, and they were plagued with mechanical problems due to saltwater corrosion during shipping. Wasn't the Thunderbolt's fault. For some reason, they were not prepared properly for ocean travel, which was pretty inexcusable considering the U.S. had been shipping Thunderbolts to Europe for quite some time at that point. Then we have the P-47 Novembers, which only saw combat during the last few weeks of the war. It was the ultimate version of the Thunderbolt, but just didn't see a lot of action in World War II. So of the Thunderbolts that did, the D-40 was the ultimate version. By the way, I apologize for my voice. I'm a bit under the weather, but the video's got to get made. I don't want to delay it. Now, I'm sorry about the dog barking. She's upset about something. Anyhow, I want to go all around the airplane because it's rare to be able to get so close to one of these planes, let alone a D-40 with an intact turbo supercharging system. So let's get started. This plane has a Hamilton standard hydraulic prop, which is unusual. Most Thunderbolts, like this one, have a Curtis electric prop. The Curtis emblems are visible on the prop blades. I know you can't read them from here, but the Curtis emblems are round. Hamilton standard emblems are oval, so they're easy to tell apart in pictures, even from a distance. However, this isn't really a reliable way to tell because often the emblems are missing or the engine is running and you can't see them. So a better way to tell the difference is to look at the spinner. The Curtis props have a long and narrow kind of pointy spinner as this one does. Understand that this is not a paddle prop versus non-paddle prop issue. There were both Curtis and Hamilton standard paddle bladed props. The difference is primarily in the mechanism controlling the prop, electric versus hydraulic. The prop blades themselves are slightly different between the Curtis and Hamilton standard paddle props, but that's not the main difference. The plane in this picture has the Curtis paddle prop with propeller cuffs, which was typical of a late war Thunderbolt. Now let's look at a Hamilton standard prop. Notice the emblems are oval, that's a dead giveaway, but more importantly, the spinner on the Thunderbolt is a different shape and has a bolt in the center. Here's another one. Hamilton standards were far less common on Thunderbolts. I haven't seen any production numbers, but judging from pictures of these planes, I think maybe about 1 in 10 P-47s had Hamilton standard props, if that. Performance of the two types were about the same as long as you're comparing paddle prop to paddle prop. Back to our museum aircraft. You can clearly see that it has a Hamilton standard prop. I don't think it left the factory that way, but I don't know. I did ask, but the staff member I asked didn't know. It's more likely that it was originally built with a Curtis Electric and was converted to Hamilton standard when it was restored. A friend of mine is a volunteer. Uh, his name's Justin at this museum, and unfortunately, uh, he wasn't there that day, so I, I uh, wasn't really sure who to talk to. I talked to a couple of people, and neither one knew the answer to that question. Now, notice the big air scoop under the engine. It's divided into three sections. The outboard sections feed air to the two oil coolers left and right. The center section feeds air to the turbocharger air inlet and intercooler inlets. It, it branches off farther downstream. Now, it's interesting to note that the dividers here are made with wood, um, and then they have aluminum sheathing around it. Just aft of the cowling, we can find the external power receptacle. 
Batteries back then were not very strong, so when possible, it was preferred to start the Thunderbolt with external power and then turn on the plane's battery after the engine was started. Here we have the oil cooler shutters. Close them up for less drag or open them for more oil cooling. Typically, these would be fully open on the ground and during takeoff and neutral for high-speed flight. This is the turbo wastegate. There's one on each side. A lever in the cockpit opens and closes this to increase or reduce exhaust flow through the turbine. Notice the manual meshing control. That's not in the manual and I'm not sure what it is. I suspect it has something to do with starting, but that's a pure guess. I'm sure someone in the comments will know. Here is the inboard leading edge of the right wing. We can see the gun camera port. This camera could be triggered either by itself or whenever the guns were fired as determined by a selector switch in the cockpit. The big vent inlet there provided air to the cockpit. The P-47 needed quite a bit of cockpit air because the exhaust and turbo system plumbing ran below into the sides of the cockpit and tended to heat it up. Moving along, here is the dive brake. When deployed, these do two things. They add drag, slowing the plane down, and they force the nose up, also helping to slow it down. When up against the plane's Mach limits, these are a big help. They allow the pilot to really push things far in terms of Mach limits in a dive with confidence that recovery will be easy. These were on D30s and all subsequent D models and the Mike models. They were not on Novembers because that internal space was used for more fuel tanks. Notice the inboard gear doors. This is going to be a bit of a discussion. A lot of World War II fighters didn't have these, but they do provide a significant reduction in drag by fully enclosing the landing gear when it's retracted. Along with the Corsair, the P-47 was one of the first fighters to have fully enclosed gear, including the tail wheel. The tail wheel doesn't just retract, it has its own little gear doors back there. This and other features on the Corsair and Thunderbolt, and later the P-51 Mustang, were the result of a NACA drag test, which I have covered before uh, at, at great length in earlier episodes. Now, back to the inboard gear doors. These are different from what you will find on a P-51 Mustang. The Mustang's gear doors are closed when the gear is extended or retracted. So they open when the gear is in transit. For example, if you watch a video of a P-51 Mustang taking off, you will see that the gear doors open, then the gear comes up, and then the gear doors close. This gives the benefit of more lift and less drag with the gear extended versus in transit because you don't have big holes in the wing and gear doors hanging down. Well, you still have holes in the wing, but they're smaller because the gear doors cover up a portion of them. Side note, if a Mustang sits on the ground with the engine shut down long enough, the gear doors will droop open, but once the engine is started, they will close. Actually, once the engine starts cranking over, they will start to close. All right, I had to pause there for a minute, take care of the phone beeping, the dog barking, and all the other interruptions that happen when I make videos at home, which isn't too common. Normally, I do these at layovers. Anyhow, uh, in the Thunderbolt, you have giant holes in the wing whenever the gear is down because these gear doors are always open, although they're smaller than the gear doors in the Mustang, so the Thunderbolt has that going for it. Now, one of the times you have to take this factor into consideration is on a short field takeoff with an obstacle at the end of the runway. In the Mustang, lift will decrease and drag will increase during retraction, so you'll probably be better off leaving the gear down until clear of the obstacle. In the Thunderbolt, if trying to clear an obstacle at the end of the runway, you should probably retract the gear as soon as you leave the ground and you have a positive rate of climb because it won't make any more drag or less lift with the gear in transit. So I hope that made sense. Another consideration is that in the Mustang, the sequence of events can be screwed up if you don't let the gear extend or retract all the way before reversing it. For example, if you put the gear down and while it's in transit, you get jumped by enemy fighters, you will have to wait for it to be down and locked before retracting it. If instead you panic and try to retract the gear while it's in transit going down, it will get the gear doors out of sequence and the landing gear will crunch into the gear doors and then you can't retract it at all. In the P-47, those doors are linked to the gear. They can't get out of sequence, so this isn't a factor. Now, overall, I have to say that I personally feel that the P-51 system is better in most situations because it suffers less of a performance decrement with the gear down. 
But there certainly isn't any consensus on this. Planes are still built both ways. For example, the F-22 is set up like the P-47 in this regard. These are multicolored recognition lights. They were installed in one form or another on most, if not all, U.S. Army Air Force and U.S. Navy aircraft in World War II. Typically, these would be red, green, and amber. Very little is written about these. About the only mention of them I see in documents from the period are statements in the pilot manual saying that they exist, and not much more. This is from a late war P-47 manual, and it's all it says about them. P-47s had a few different configurations for these, depending on the model, but the D-40 would have these controls in the cockpit. And no, I didn't just climb board the museum's Thunderbolt. This picture is from the U.S. Air Force Museum's website, and this picture is from their D-40. So it should be what's in the plane we're looking at today. The P-47 has three recognition lights, red, green, and amber, there is a position for a white switch, but it was not installed in the Thunderbolt. This is probably a good example of parts being designed for multiple applications. The switches for those lights have three positions. The middle switch, correction, the middle position is off. The up position turns the light on, on steady as they call it. And the bottom position means they will come on when you push the red button, allowing a code to be flashed, like Morse code or whatever on, off, or dot, dot dash, type code you wanted to use. I haven't seen a single primary source that talks about actually using these things in any detail. Either they were very rarely used, or they were so secretive that hardly anyone ever mentioned them. I think they were intended to be used as sort of a primitive identify friend or foe system when flying over friendly forces, and with a secondary purpose of being able to flash very short messages. In some multi-crew aircraft, they had a handheld device which plugged into the plane's electrical system and had changeable lenses, and allowed crew members to flash signals to the ground or to other airplanes. In the case of the B-25, they could mount this thing in the upper turret and aim it with the turret's reflector sight which strongly suggests there was at least some intention of using these things for air-to-air -air communications. But I haven't read of a single case of this happening. In short, I don't know for sure how or even if these things were used in practice, so let's move on. Of course, the D-40 has the bubble canopy. That started with the D-25. Previous models were Razorbacks. A lot of people think that all D models were bubble tops, but that's not the case. That was only on the D-25s and higher. Republic came out with improvements to the plane almost every month. There were 29 different sub-variants of the P-47D alone. That's obviously not counting B, Cs, Ms, and so forth. The bubble tops were significantly different from the earlier airplanes. It wasn't just the canopy that was changed. These planes had 30-gallon water methanol tanks, double the size of the previous models. They also had 370 gallons of internal fuel capacity versus 305 for the earlier models. Of course, these changes and others added weight, over 500 pounds worth, but the extra capability was worth it. Notice the dorsal fin going forward along the top of the fuselage from the vertical stabilizer. Apparently some of the stability was lost when going from the razor back to the bubble top, and this fin was an attempt to get some of it back, and by all accounts it worked, at least to some extent. All D-40s have this fin, although by itself it doesn't identify a D-40 because they started using them from the D-30 on, and they could be retrofitted to older bubble tops. Also, there were at least two and maybe three different dorsal fins used on these planes. It's a little hard to tell sometimes to see the details of these fins in pictures. Now, the ailerons are large and effective. The P-47 has a very good roll rate, and they have trim tabs that can be adjusted from the cockpit, which is nice for long flights. They're designed so that they don't buffet at high speeds. However, they do get heavy at high speeds, which was typical of World War II fighters, but in the Thunderbolt, they wouldn't get so heavy that a strong pilot couldn't deal with it. In fact, the ailerons themselves were not the limiting factor for roll at high speed in this airplane. The big problem was that around 540 miles per hour, so smoking fast, the ailerons could still be moved, but the roll direction would reverse because the wing itself would flex. 
In other words, at 540 miles per hour, the ailerons became trim tabs for a wing warping system, and the plane would roll opposite of the pilot's input, which isn't cool. Now, this was corrected on the November models, which is why it has a much higher maximum dive speed. Still, the book speed for the D model was 500 miles per hour, which is still a very high dive speed and keeps you safely away from this problem at around 540. I have a whole video on Thunderbolt dive speed, so I don't feel like going into it farther here. The wing flaps are hydraulically operated, which was the typical American way of doing it. The same hydraulic system powers the landing gear and the cowl flaps. The wing flaps are large and slotted, making them much more effective than the typical split flap design that was in vogue at the time, like what you would see on a P-40 Warhawk, for example. The slot allows extra air to flow from the bottom of the wing over the top of the flap, turning the flap into its own independent airfoil, but with a very high angle of attack. Slotted flaps are very effective. However, flaps down stall speeds were published for the Thunderbolt with the gear down. In other words, they published stall speed, either gear and flaps up or gear and flaps down. And as we know, the P-47 has some huge holes in the wing with the gear down. Yet even with that drawback, the P-47s flaps still bring the stall speed from 115 miles per hour gear and flaps up to 100 miles per hour gear and flaps down. The Thunderbolt's flaps do have some issues. First of all, flap control in this airplane is awkward to use. For example, to go from up to 10 degrees, you have to move the control from up to down and then back up to neutral to stop them in place at the desired position. And timing that move back to neutral takes some practice at least if you want to be able to stop them at a specific setting without looking at the wing like you're, while you're trying to keep your eyes on a target, for example. This is harder to use than planes that have specific controls to set the flaps, flaps for whatever the pilot wants, takeoff, landing, combat, or whatever. That said, you can do it in a Thunderbolt, and with 10 degrees of flaps, the Thunderbolt's a pretty agile airplane. But using this in combat is tricky because it's so hard to set them accurately without looking at the flap. I don't think it was done very often, it if at all. Now there's another problem in that the Thunderbolt's flaps were not mechanically linked to each other and could come down at different rates, inducing a strong roll tendency. So you should put them up or down in small increments. Don't just go from full up to full down in one shot or vice versa. Sometimes with battle damage or a malfunction, only one will come down, which creates a very dangerous situation. Again, this danger could be mitigated by moving them in small increments. Here, we have the right side intercooler outlet. There's an identical one on the other side of the airplane. The doors open and close to increase cooling at the expense of drag. They are fully open in this picture, or I think very near fully open. In most situations in flight, these would be in the neutral position. This was the first time I was able to see a P-47 with its turbo system intact and get close enough to see this intercooler, so I was pretty happy about that. After the air leaves the turbocharger, it goes through this intercooler, and then that air goes to the mechanically driven supercharger where it is further boosted in pressure. At altitude, most of the boost is coming from the turbo. Now, there were a couple different turbos used in these airplanes, and they were quite efficient for the time. At the rear of the airplane, we have the all-metal tail and a nice view of that ventral fin we talked about. Over time, horsepower went up in Thunderbolts. They started at 2,000 horsepower, and bubble tops usually had 2,600 horsepower, via 64 inches of manifold pressure at 2400, correction, 2700 RPM, and with water methanol injection spraying. In June of 1944, they upped this to 70 inches of manifold pressure. Horsepower in this configuration was unpublished, but was likely just over 2700. Eventually, they went to 2800 for the mics and Novembers. All that power was great, but the asymmetrical forces of that giant prop could overcome the rudder authority on very high power D models when just above the stall speed. So pilots did have to be careful if using all that power at low airspeeds. That's a typical problem actually when power is increased on a prop driven aircraft. It's sometimes hard to get the airframe to keep up with the engine developments and Republic did pretty well here with the Thunderbolt 
but it was near its limits at the end, which is why Republic was working on the XP-72 before they switched to jets. I have a video covering that airplane if you're interested. I also have all the P-47 manuals used in this video in my Patreon section, which you might enjoy. Patreon members get early access to some videos, and we have discussions there and polls to determine the direction of this channel and more. Please consider joining our ranks. Now, this D-40 may have or may have had tail warning radar. Plenty of secondary sources say that D-40s had it. However, there is no P-47 D-40 specific pilot manual that I know of. The manual for the November makes it clear that some of those had tail warning radar, but I have never found anything official saying that the regular production D-40 had it. Furthermore, the D-40 at the U.S. Army Air Force Museum in Dayton does not appear to have the controls for the tail warning radar in the cockpit. I'll also add that the DCS P-47 D-40 doesn't have it. And yes, I know that's a sim, but they do their research pretty well. It's a very accurate sim. That said, I think the D-40 was at least intended to have tail warning radar and that some probably did. Furthermore, I think that this really hard to see square here indicates this. I think this is an access panel for the antenna mounting for that system. Although it's hard to see in this picture because of the angle, this example does actually have an antenna there. You can see it as we pan around the airplane and come to the tail, which I'll do in a moment. This theory about that square on the tail is hard to verify though because it's a detail that's way too small to see in pictures from the war. But two of the D-40s in museums that I have seen both have this square and the earlier planes don't seem to have it. As we pan around, notice the lift holes in the aft fuselage. The idea behind those was that you could put a bar through the airplane and people on each side could lift up the tail and move the plane around. It was pretty standard on US fighters. Just here you can see that antenna we're talking about. I have no idea if those are for tail warning radar or something on this airplane that's more modern because it operates in the modern airspace system. The only wartime pictures I have seen of the tail warning radar system shows a totally different antenna, so who knows. The rest of the museum was amazing. It was well worth a visit, and uh, the people that do work in the restoration shop seem to do some really impressive stuff. To give you an idea of what they're capable of, they plan to restore this P-47. I didn't even realize this was a P-47 until I looked at it for a few seconds. This one still has its original paint from the war. The damage to the fuselage was such that I learned things looking through the gaps that I never would have known. I'll give just one example because I need to wrap this up. As we know, there are indicators in the cockpit on the left sidewall for intercooler and oil cooler shutter position. It turns out these are entirely mechanically operated. A small chain, smaller than a bicycle chain, moves them through a complex mechanism involving chains and gears. It's easy to forget how much complexity was in these airplanes, even for what by modern standards you would think would be a very simple system, a, a position indicator, for example. But these planes really were truly incredible in, in the effort and engineering that went into design and building these things. It's time to wrap this up. Please consider joining my Patreon group Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Oh, and just one more thing. After I left the museum, I used some of that Patreon money to go here, so I should probably show it to you. This KC-97 is now a restaurant. The left engine and uh, left wing, so engine one and a bit of the left wing, protrude into the building. You can eat in there near that wing or engine, but instead I went upstairs and ate in the airplane itself. I have to say the food was okay, not amazing. The prices were high, which is typical of a hotel restaurant, which this really is. However, I wasn't there expecting a great deal on fancy food, so I enjoyed my burger and had a good time exploring the airplane. I learned that the KC-97 is a lot more different from a B-29 than I would have thought. A look at the flight engineer station shows that. Also, I'll mention that the waitresses were all super attractive and dressed up like air crew members, which was a nice touch and the service was outstanding.